Uh, welcome to Data Founders, a series of interviews with entrepreneurs and investors where we mostly talk about data science and startups. Today I'm talking to uh, Patrick Short, who is a co-founder and the CEO of Seno Genetics. And uh, what is Seno? It's a user-centric genetic data sharing platform. You can see straight away that it's really relevant for the community and sounds very interesting. So Patrick, we are happy to have you here. Thank you for joining. Thanks so much, Peter. It's really great to be here. Fantastic. So just to kick off, maybe you can talk a bit more about the company and about yourself, your role and your background. Just sure. Yeah. Much. Very happy to. Um, so in terms of the company, we started uh, just a little over three years ago now. Um, I was finishing up my PhD here in the UK. Um, I'm from the US originally, but moved over to Cambridge, UK to do my PhD in large scale genome sequencing projects. Um, and I met my co-founders while I was working on PhD and then uh, started the company basically in the final year while I was doing my PhD and, and then started really full-time working on it straight after that. What we aim to do then and, and still aim to do as a company today is to accelerate the transition to personalized medicine. So for the last 20 or 30 years, we've been uh, undergoing a transition driven in large part by genome sequencing and other forms of genomic data from one size fits all to a much more personalized um, and, and precise uh, healthcare system that includes better diagnoses and then ultimately better treatments and, and hopefully prevention as well for as many diseases as possible. So as a company, we're trying to build that infrastructure to really close the loop from research discovery through to impact on people and patients and back into research and discovery to make that go from where it's probably 15 years to go from a discovery to a deployment in the healthcare system to make that as fast as possible. And we think by embracing um, things like digital technology and, and at-home testing, we can close that loop to be years, months, days, maybe, maybe someday, uh, even faster than that. So uh, we're still early in the journey, about three years in, um, and we have an online platform that helps people who wanna take part in research to add information about themselves and find research that's relevant to them. And we have at home DNA testing kits that allow us to um, genetically test and profile people to see if they're relevant for precision medicine studies that we work on. So it, it's a very data intensive um, platform and company that we're building. And, and in terms of my personal background, most of my PhD work was in analyzing large whole genome and whole exome sequencing data sets to, to try to understand what's going on in the case of, uh, of rare diseases in particular. And we as a company focus on both rare and common diseases. Mm -hmm. um, that's a great thing, and I guess it touches upon many different aspects of actually different businesses, different types of business within, let's call it for a moment, biotechnology sector. So it would be fantastic if you can maybe highlight uh, what's adjacent to what you are doing, what other data-driven and data-heavy uh, types of businesses within this wider umbrella uh, can some people look at. Yeah, great question. And I think maybe it would help to, to talk about how we think of the healthcare system in general and, and, and drug discovery that, that sits within it. So there's a framework that I like, which is called the three Ds. You have drug discovery, development, and then deployment into, into patients and people. So there are different companies that either work specifically in one of those three, discover, develop, or deploy. Um, and there are companies like us that aim to work across that whole spectrum. Um, and then obviously, even within any one of those, you can continue to, um, to segment down further in drug discovery. There's, uh, you know, many different markets and, and companies and approaches. Um, but ultimately, that whole process takes 15 to 20 years. And the failure rate is, is immense, even just from the develop to deploy the clinical trials phase alone, the failure rate is, is well over 90%. Um, so that's where we're actually focused today is in clinical trials that have a personalized medicine element. So use genetic testing. Um, traditionally, the way that clinical trials have worked is that the pharma or biotech companies that have discovered a new potential treatment uh, go and set up physically at sites, um, tens to hundreds of hospitals or private clinical research sites in order to find patients for whom that medicine might be 
uh, might be better for them than, than what they're currently uh, on, whether it's a existing therapy that's not working for them, or in many cases, if there's just no treatment whatsoever. Uh, the way this has changed a lot in the last 10 to 20 years is as the medicines that are being developed are becoming more and more data-driven than the old model for setting up at hospitals or, or private clinical research sites and looking for patients there is, is starting to become less and less efficient, slower, more and more expensive, because often all the data that you require is not in a single place. It's not always held by the healthcare system or held by uh, the doctor or held by the patient themselves. So our, our aim is to really pull together different strands of data using a software enabled platform and to also use things like at home testing to add data where, where it doesn't yet exist and, and where it doesn't yet exist is in a lot of common diseases like Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's where genetic testing just isn't done by the healthcare system. So in terms of competitors and other kinds of companies that exist, there's been a whole, there's more than 300 direct to consumer genetic testing companies. So these are companies like 23andMe or Ancestry that sell DNA test kits direct to consumers. There's also um, a whole group of contract research organizations and clinical research organizations that uh, help pharma and biotech companies to conduct the clinical trials process. So we really sit kind of in between those two. We are we are a direct to consumer company in the sense that we have a, an online patient platform, but we don't sell our tests to patients. We offer them for free as a part of research studies. And we work really closely with many of the existing CROs to help them to take the personalized medicine studies that they're helping to run and, and help them run them more effectively, mm -hmm. quickly, cost effectively. That, that, that's a fantastic overview and I guess it's uh, quite an interesting framework and what was your let's, let's call it ideation or maybe discovery process so did you were you exploring every element out of the three one by one and then picked uh, the idea that you need to collect connect all of them or it was less analytical and maybe you were you knew from the start what you want to do so what was your mental model and what kind of a model other founders may use in order to identify a great use case for data science? Yeah, it's, it's a fantastic question. It's something we wrestled with a lot um, in the early stages companies still do today. So our, our long-term vision is to build something that cuts across that whole discover, develop, deliver um, pipeline. But we knew from the beginning that we would not be able to get to that within three years, that there was a sequence that we you know, that we needed to go to because um, all three of those don't develop at the same pace and also the capital required to put together a product that addressed all three of those at once would, would have been immense. So we spent a lot of time in the beginning, um, A, building the, the core parts of the platform that we knew would address all the segments. And that includes things like um, the, the online platform for, recontacting participants with new research opportunities, building the reports, the genetic reports that we create, um, simple things like electronic consent and the whole framework that sits around that as well as the at-home tests. And then we spent a lot of time to your point of, of getting an understanding within each of those different markets and um, you know high level pieces where, where are we most likely to get traction today? Um, and where is, it, where is it something where once we've built up the platform, we can move horizontally and um, and move into new markets later. So the two we focused the most on were the early stage drug discovery, which is pharma and biotechs using big data, geno you know, genomic and clinical data to understand why do some patients respond to treatments when others don't, which proteins should we be targeting to better treat disease um, and helping them to really pick which are the drugs that we're gonna put into the stage two of development. And then the second area where we really looked and, um, and ultimately decided to, to double down on our focus was in the clinical trials stage. So once someone had discovered a genetically targeted therapy, how do they actually um, get the body of evidence to prove that it's safe and works? Um, and that really is the crucial step to getting it from in the lab uh, and, and in the R&D phase really into hundreds, thousands, or, or millions of patients, depending on the, the uh, frequency of the, the prevalence of the disease. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, if, if I'm not diving too much into the secrets, so feel free to not to answer the question, but why did you select exactly these two elements? So what was the, again, maybe approach or framework? Did you spot some, let's say, 
uh, data sets that were missing or maybe there were no data sets at all or maybe there was too much uh, routine work that need to be automated so i'm trying to guess and trying to find um, a reason to pick exactly these these blocks just to show other founders an example how you can approach to selection and to prioritization of what to focus on yeah definitely and and you'll generally find one of our core values as a company is transparency and we reflect that in the platform where participants have full control of their data and can download it and delete it and we also aim to do that for internal employees and, and how we talk about building building what we're building so we're very happy to go into it and it, it it's very similar to what you what you said so we saw a couple things in particular about both data sets and and like product models that weren't yet existing that we knew from our research um, experience ought to exist so the the big part that we saw that was missing was there's been a huge investment into generating genomic data sets by the government by the private sector and um, by nonprofit organizations and biobanks but almost none of these have a a digital interface for uh, for patients or participants in those research studies that could enable long-term data collection recontact. Um, and this is, we felt like a, leaving a huge amount of um, uh, potential untapped from the research perspective, because what it meant for us as researchers is it was, it was basically impossible to recontact participants on any, for any meaningful time scale or, um, or cost. So that meant that the, the research that you could do was then severely limited because mm -hmm. you could only work with the data that you had. And yeah. so we felt like the, the most important thing to build first was a way to take the rich data that's already being collected and enable recontact directly to those individuals to ask, um, you know, is this, is, uh, is this the case? Is this correct? Would you be interested in taking part in research, et cetera? And there was one kind of anecdote that, um, that really like resonated with us early on there was this big uh, announcement kind of research paper all about what was called genetic superheroes at the time so these researchers had looked into large databases of genetic data and found people that were carrying genetic variants that should have caused a severe disease but as far as they could tell those people were healthy um, so they hadn't reported a disease in this database but the real achilles heel of that research was none of that data was actually linked to a person that they could recontact so they couldn't rule out that the person had the disease and it wasn't reported correctly or that the there was an error in the sequencing so actually they didn't have the variant at all and so that this you know small detail of we couldn't recontact those people and make sure they didn't have the disease meant um you know, the, the usefulness of the research was orders of magnitude less than it could have been so we thought suppose you actually could recontact those people and they turned out to um, have a genetic variant that in 99.9% .9 of people causes severe disease, but in these people, it doesn't. That's a remarkable opportunity to discover something that's protective of a, of a potential severe genetic disease. And, and so then that kind of from a product or a, uh, a kind of mechanistic uh, infrastructure approach, we knew it had a few different potential use cases, including clinical trials and the, and the earlier stage. Um, R&D research. So that's why we, we focused on those initially. You, you mentioned very interesting trend, like um, an increasing volumes of this genetic data. And that was, um, that is a trend that you can work with. Uh, are there any interesting trends uh, at the, maybe from the economic side, politics, social trends that potential entrepreneurs, want to be founders uh, can look at and to use associated and related with genetics maybe biotechnology quite of at, at a wider scale like what do they need to track and to pay attention to maybe to come up with idea of the next startup yeah great question there's a couple i think really interesting sort of macro trends the first is in drug development in general we can see that in 10, 10 years from now, probably the majority of medicines will be personalized medicines. It's not the case today. It's only the case in cancer that the majority of medicines are genetically genetically targeted. Um, but we can see based on the drugs that are in early development, phase one clinical trials, which is the first phase where you test safety, that actually in 10 years, more drugs are going to be personalized than non-personalized, which is an exciting kind of sea change 
um, just in terms of the industry as a whole. The second big piece is in the last five years or so, governments have started to invest significant resources in what we call population genomics. So one of the first places to do this at a large scale was the UK. Um, and this includes the UK Biobank, which is half a million people, the 100,000 Genomes Project. And they've recently announced a, a project to sequence 5 million people in the UK, which is about 10% of the population. Um, there are a number of Scandinavian and European countries that have uh, been doing population scale sequencing as well, really well for a long time, including Finland and Estonia and others. It's happening in the US. Now there's more than 30 countries that have announced plans to start to basically do genetic testing in millions of, of people as part of the healthcare system. So what's unique about genetics, and I have a clear bias because I studied it and, and I'm interested in it, but it's a test that you really only have to do once um, and you can read, read and reinterpret that data for a person's entire life, which is very, un very unique. Um, there are very few things that are like that in healthcare. Often you have to do a test um, you have blood work constantly, for example. Um, but this is a big change in terms of how we're likely, hopefully, to, to do healthcare in the coming decades because it enables us to shift to um, predictive and preventive. I think the real thing that needs to catch up that is holding things back is the, the economic models of how healthcare systems pay for mm -hmm. prevention because in the, in the US, most places are really not set up to do that in single payer systems like the UK and, and other countries in Europe, it's, it's probably going to be um, easier to, to make that change. But still, if you're, if you're genetically testing someone now and predicting that they've got a higher, and they're 20 years old, and you're predicting they've got a higher chance of a heart attack when they're 60, um, then it can be really challenging to economically model how you, um, you know, how you make those, how you make the inputs and outputs work over a 40 year time frame. Uh, these are both very interesting trends and I wanted to pick up maybe on the part associated with uh, uh, incentives and payment actually because in data science I would say the majority of startups are monetized through kind of let's call it traditional uh, enterprise methods like subscription maybe at least people aim to subscription right sometimes they do a lot of consulting or project work or engineering additional kind of custom engineering but the end goal is to get a subscription, right? And to ask a large corporation to pay you monthly per seat or whatever. In your case, in the case of the business where you operate, to me, as an outsider at least, it seems like very complex stuff. There are different incentives, there are different payers, uh, and uh, I, I'm just probably scratching the surface, right? So how an entrepreneur, or maybe how do you think about monetization in such a complex environment? Yeah, it's another great question. So we we do have a relatively complex business model because we're we're aiming to build a multi sided platform. Um, and so I spend a lot of time thinking about the incentives of the different participants in the platform because really they all have to line up and they all have to be a very clear value proposition if if you want things to take off. So I can give you a simple example and part of the reason we focused on clinical trials initially is the value proposition is really clear for all the parties for participants they are want to take part because they're not getting adequate treatment or they have no treatment currently and they're interested in in potentially trying something that um, that could be effective for them for partners that we work with like nonprofit organizations they share a similar value proposition to participants where they want to help their um, you know their members or constituents to to find something for them, it's also an opportunity to be part of groundbreaking science. And then on the um, customer side, the biotech and, and pharmas wanna find the right patients with the right data and characteristics as, as quickly and cost effectively as possible. Where, where those all line up, I think that the incentives are really clear. It's, it's fairly similar incentives for the other bucket of early stage drug discovery, where it gets a lot more challenging. And the reason that we haven't initially focused on healthcare um, is the incentives are less aligned there because the the for the reason that I just said the person who's paying for it is um, in in the UK it's the NHS in the US it's an it's a payer and insurance provider the person who's benefiting is the participant or the you know the consumer but they're not getting 
they're not necessarily getting this benefit today. They might be getting it in 40 years. So it makes it, um, you know, really challenging to, to piece all of these together. So, yeah, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about this. And one of the, I guess, frameworks that I really like for thinking about it is, um, it's, it's very simple, but it's called a, a, a who, what matrix. And if you're, especially if you are starting off and you have a few ideas, like you have a, uh, if you have a good idea of the product that you want to build, but you're unsure of who the customers are, um, you, your, your who is who your customer is going to be, who you're ultimately going to sell the subscription or service or whatever it is to. And the what is um, particular product features or, um, or, or it can be entire products. And the trick with, the, with using the framework is that you want to try not to move diagonally. So mm -hmm. the, you can move, you can sell the same what to a different who. So you have conviction around the product that you want to build. And then you go test different, um, your different customer types who may have similar, but, but, but not identical problems. Uh, or you understand a customer really well, and you really need to be flexible around the product that you build. Um, and in that case, you can, you know, you can test in, in lean ways, different product features or, um, or core value propositions for a product. And then when you're hitting on something that's really working, you want to obviously laser focus in on that and make sure you're you're delivering all that you can within that that square of the matrix. Um, but when it comes time to move or think about where you go next, then do all you can to move horizontally or vertically rather than jumping to a, both a new customer and a new product because then you've got to learn from scratch what the incentives are. That's a super interesting framework about being laser focused really and about prioritizing things. Maybe to pick up on that, on prioritization, at the beginning of the talk, you mentioned a very interesting thing, and you started to talk about the company. You mentioned that first you've built the system for recontracting individual friends. I guess you mentioned something about uh, um, privacy, these kind of things, and you didn't mention data science. And to me, that's, that's a super insightful thing, because I hear it a lot from entrepreneurs when they kind of you know, think retrospectively about what they build, they really understand and show that sometimes data science is super important, but it's not the first thing that you build. Uh, do you think, uh, what could be the framework maybe to prioritizing when to double down on data science, when to hire more people into data science, when a founder who is who might be and frequently is a data scientist or researcher himself or herself, it sits with Python and do the data science and when he or she doesn't. So how to how to prioritize that? Yeah, it's. I think it's a it's a great question because I also see this where people. If you know data science, then you sort of immediately jump to that as the core competency. But I think you need to align your your thinking and company planning with how you're going to deliver value to your customers. And if that is by doubling down on data science, then then that's great. But in our case, we we knew that first and foremost, the most valuable thing we could deliver would be. Uh, recontactability and scale of the number of participants and data that we have access to. So, a particular in you know in, in the network and on the platform. In if we had instead focused on development of a new algorithm or approach, but didn't have the you know the the mass of data required or the recontactability, then ultimately we're we're not going to deliver any value in, in any sustainable way. So I would think really carefully about what what actually is it that that you need to unlock to to deliver real value and it depends on the the company i think if you're if you're able to access uh data sets that you you know from from others partners collaborators that you can use to validate a new algorithm or approach and actually what you are developing and building is ultimately a an algorithm that can travel and go to data sources and analyze them then it probably is the right thing to double down on data science talent, assuming you have the, the data that you need. But if actually your, you know, your, your approach is, is to access and offer analysis on top of data that you collect rather than somebody else's data, then you, you want to think about it a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. Great, great, yes. And um, you mentioned your background uh, is research. And as far as I remember, you met your co-founder Charlotte, I guess, during the research program as well, right? So the composition of the team in your case is very research driven, right? 
Yeah, that's right. So I met um, so three co-founders, myself, Charlotte, and Will, um, and all of us were doing. So Will was at the um, European Bioinformatics Institute. Charlotte was at the Sanger, and I was at the Sanger. And so Will's our CTO, Charlotte's our our COO, and and I'm the CEO. And we all have come from a, a research background. Um, but we have had exp personal experiences as well on the kind of participant side. Uh, so we'd seen both sides of the coin, but we definitely were, um, I think in contrast to this, this, as I mentioned before, 300 direct to consumer genetic testing companies. And all of those approach often from like a health and wellness and consumer, very consumer centric. Ours, ours was coming from more of a research centric. And, and for us, we saw different problems in the industry, which is how do we um, actually accelerate the research aspects of precision medicine and personalized medicine. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you look at your kind of research background, maybe I'm sure there are a lot of interesting things that really you can you can extrapolate, you can generalize, maybe, and you can use as an entrepreneur. I mean, your skills, some knowledge, right? Uh, what would be maybe top two or top two, top three things that uh, really a good researcher will be able to uh, transfer into his entrepreneurial journey. Yeah, great question. I, I also think I also think there are some negatives that you that mm -hmm. you need to unlearn as well. That I'll um uh, or, or, or or augment, but even more interesting. Yeah, no, the the um the real positive. So I think what a what a PhD and and um, research career teaches you is is a, an element of truth seeking, and you'd be very you won't delude. You know, generally speaking, if you're a good researcher, you won't um kind of twist the data to support a hypothesis you'll be you'll be truth seeking which i think is a real um really powerful in an early stage company because it will help you to understand where when are things working when are things not working and and enable you to be really data driven um i think the second part is it teaches you how to go really deep in a particular topic area and, and gives you a, often a depth of understanding that's um, that's really hard for someone who hasn't spent four or five years solely focused on a particular topic to, to get that depth of understanding. I think where, um, where the research background can slow you down is that you can be, I think, over, overly perfectionist. I know in the, um, in, you know, in, in academic publishing, it, it, uh, some of my papers that I wrote while I was a PhD student took more than a year to go from submission to uh, reviews and edits and and ultimately get out into the world and it that that kind of time you don't often have the luxury of that as a seed or series a stage startup because you need to move things you know very quickly and and you need to be comfortable with the with, with the right with the, what do i need to do to de-risk and understand if i'm moving the right direction versus um does this does this particular piece actually need to be perfect in an academic research often almost every piece um, needs to be perfect, uh, or at least that's sort of the, the culture that exists because um, because of the the way the incentives are. Um, and I think there are also a lot of um, there's just a lot of skills that you don't necessarily have, um, in particular around sales and marketing and and people skills, working with teams and managing teams. That uh, I think you have to be intentional about you yourself as a founder learning those things. Um, whether it's through conversations with others, books, podcasts, whatever it is that the medium that you like, um, and making sure that you're you're not just uh, solely focused on the science and using the company as a way to um, to allow you to just do science in a different aspect, but actually really leaning into the fact that you're building a company um, and you really need those other aspects and can't be afraid of you as the as the founder being the you know number one salesperson for the first two three years of the company at least. I guess it's a very important point, and uh, I see that happens uh, in the enterprise setting quite frequently. That founders, but it takes time for them to arrive to the idea that it should be founder-led sales. Even though a lot of investors, as outsiders, they talk about that, but it's important that you also you also acknowledge that as a founder. Um, if you look in particular at this part of the routine let's call it routine sales or maybe customer development processes what were your biggest learnings maybe and what advice you can give to somebody who has a research background or engineering background regarding maybe sales or maybe customer development these kind of commercial oriented things 
Yeah, it's um, it's one of the most. It really depends on how you're building the business, whether it's like whether it's critically important in the early stages or not. The way we chose to run the business was to be um, pretty commercially focused from the start and and generating revenue and validating that our kind of co- that our customer hypotheses were were the right ones. Um, and you know, this is this is this is different for every company and some choose to just be laser focused on product and R and D and, and then unveil it. But I, I like the, um, I like the more lean approach because it tells you, you get very quick feedback if you're moving the right direction. Um, in terms of sort of tactical approaches to, to sales and commercial and understanding whether you're on the right track. Um, I, I think that actually getting people to pay, it's very simple advice, but actually getting people to pay you for, the product or or services that will resemble what the future product would look like is is a very clear signal. Um, I also think you need to be very honest with yourself at the beginning stages of what what interested what an interested customer looks like and what um, what a lukewarm kind of dodging you customer looks like because they're most people will be polite and kind of string you along for a period of time. But as soon as you hit on something that's a really clear value proposition and it's a big burning need for them and they have the budget and they have the timeline, you know, you'll see things move very quickly. And so you need to be kind of, you know, ruthless in a sense that you don't, you you can't um, usually put your worldview onto someone else. If you think that the world needs to exist in a certain way, it's very challenging to go out and, and evangelize to people who don't see the world that way. You actually need to you need to find somebody who already believes that and has been waiting for, uh, you know, for someone like you who's built the solution to come along. And, and in some cases, people have often tried to build um, a, a, a rudimentary version of a solution themselves. So, uh, you know, the, the having someone who has a very clear and burning need for what you've built is the is the signal that you're looking for, mm-hmm. um, because otherwise you're too risky as a startup. You're they've not heard of you before. When they Google you, they only find your website and a few other things. So if you, you know, if, if you need them to take the leap for you, then you need to be solving a, a really kind of clear and burning problem for them. Uh, you mentioned this, this very important signal, this kind of flag, maybe. If a customer, potential customer, tried to build something himself within the organization and it didn't work out, that, that's a good sign that they interested. Do you think that there are some other more or less generalizable flags that people within a biotechnology space or maybe um, a computational uh, bioinformatics space may actually try to spot when talking to customers to place them in a certain bucket. So this one is dodging one and this one really wants me. Uh, are there any flags here? Yeah, so them them, um, them having tried or thought about telling you they've you know thought about building it themselves and are so glad that it exists and they don't have to build themselves as a good one i think an, another one which is really simple is understanding whether the cadence of them moving through the process with you is is fast or is it sluggish so this is again a sort of very tactical thing but if you if you try to end every meeting with a prospective customer with very clear next steps and if those next if if they're there with you and um, they'll schedule that meeting next week to follow up and and you know they'll they're willing to talk about what the timeline might look like and pricing might look like and who the budget holder is and you're getting those very strong signals that they're serious about moving forward um, then that's you know that, that that's a very clear signal whereas if you're if they're saying well I've got to think about it and talk to other people and uh, you know I'll, I'll get back to you let's not schedule a meeting now but let me do some thinking on it then it doesn't mean you should you should you know, abandon them and you can continue to, to follow up and be persistent. But you, when you find people who, who are really responding rapidly and, and it's, and, you know, there's clear, there's a number of different frameworks, but the simplest one is budget authority need and timeline. If they've got all, if they seem to have all those things, then, um, then, you know, you're, you're pushing on that thread and then really understanding when, when things um, either work or they don't work from a commercial standpoint with the with the new customer understanding why and whether that's um, something that can generalize to a much broader range of customers and you can then start thinking about how do we go from you know zero to one to two and then from two to ten 
um, by just understanding what it, what is the actual problem that mm -hmm. uh, that I'm solving for this person. And often it's it's different. It's almost always different than what you think from the outside, even if just in sort of subtle ways. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool. And uh, from what I understand is that we talked at least about two very important um, kind of pieces of founders background. We talked about the main expertise. In your case, you were doing this genetics research, right? And then we talked about this commercial expertise, different types of knowledge for customer development or sales. And imagine if we talk about a founder who is also a researcher, but who doesn't have a research domain expertise. Let's say it's someone from, I don't know, general computer sciences, or maybe who works on researching computer vision. And this person, for whatever reason, maybe personal one, quite frequently I see that some personal reason, want to move into, let's say, biotechnology or healthcare. Do you think that there are specific technical knowledge, maybe specific uh, data sets or specific algorithms that may make this person highly competitive? I can give you an example. For instance, I've heard that in um, financial services like high frequency trading, etc., cetera, uh, astrophysicists are quite uh, required and they're quite uh, strong because they work with a very noisy signal. They try to analyze space, a lot of noise there. So market chatter, also a lot of noise, zero domain expertise, but underlining uh, horizontal things might be the same. Uh, can, do, do you think something like that happens May, may happen uh, for healthcare or biotechnology or bioinformatics. Yes, uh, absolutely, hundred percent. I think one the the field of um, bioinformatics and genomics itself is really only a couple decades mm. old, and um, some of the some of the pioneers in the field, um, you know, who who you know made the jump from math or physics 10, 20 years ago, they they came with absolutely no domain expertise. Um, in biology, but but had a strong background in math and physics, and and actually my my undergraduate degree was in math and biology, um, and there's a there's a lot of I think anyone with a good understanding of math or computer science can make the jump into into bioinformatics. I think the the interesting parts of the of generally speaking the data sets is similar to what you just described. Is there's they, there's a lot of noise. It's a it's a chaotic system. The human body has been kind of built up by uh, billions of years of evolution, which is duct taped, you know, other primordial things together into some functioning thing. So nothing makes sense, and it's not orderly. Um, and the the data sets that we collect are very um, they're very uh, high high P and low N in the sense that you may have a thousand samples in a in a large um, rare disease study, but each of those samples consists of 6 billion data points because the human genome is 6 billion letters long. So you, you know, in terms of classes of statistical problems, um, there's, there's a whole, you know, a whole set of statistical methods for working with, um, kinds of data where you have more, more data points than you have samples basically. Um, so I don't think there's a, I wouldn't give a specific prescription of, um, of what it is that you need to know or learn, because honestly, I think some of the best innovations come from people who come with a fresh look at things. And so, I think if it's something that you're that you're interested in, you should either join a company, um, you know, do, do a do a PhD postdoc if you're um, if you're wanting to go down the academic research route. And and I think you'll find that you can, if you have the CS and math skills, you can really pick up on the biology relatively quickly and um, and make a big impact. That's uh, very optimistic and uh, therefore a very great um, at this point. So we probably can move to closure, just to be cautious of your time. Maybe the last question I would ask you is, we talked about different things, commercial ideation, etc. But is there anything, maybe a, a theme or a question uh, or a topic that we didn't talk about, but you believe deserves to be discussed or maybe uh, at least mentioned. Feel free to talk about anything you believe is important. Yeah, I mean, I think we've covered we've covered a lot of ground, and it's been a great discussion. I think the um, the only other thing I would say is the just the importance of of your team that you build from the earliest stages and um, and beyond, because a you know, an i an idea and a product is is ultimately made by the team and people, and very rarely does a product kind of emerge from someone's brain and 
and just instantly work. So I've been, you know, I've been really fortunate to have two great co-founders, Will and Charlotte, from the very beginning, who we bring a very complementary set of skills. And as the team grows, we've we're now um, just over twenty people, and we've got a great set of people that span. Uh, yeah, I, I talked about people who have no, most of our team has no biology background. And we've done that intentionally. We bring people in on the you know, marketing, design, product, tech, commercial side that uh, that have deep domain experience somewhere else and can uh, help us to, you know, to advance the company mission to accelerate personalized medicine. But yeah, I think thinking as early as possible about how you build a great team and set the company structures up to attract great people and and help those great people to um, to excel in their job is really, um, you know, the most important thing you can do as a founder at, uh, at the end of the day. Great. It's great to hear. And uh, I guess it's important really to understand that uh, all entrepreneurship, all this success, it boils down not to venture capital money, not to some uh, technology advance, but to people who make these things happen. So really thank you for sharing your thoughts, Patrick. It's, uh, it was a pleasure to have you here. And uh, I'm sure we'll hear a lot of good news from Sano and from you as well, from your team too. Thanks so much, Peter. It was my pleasure. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Uh, not, not just this one, but all the others you've, uh, you've spent your time doing. Fantastic. Thank you.